Hi everyone and welcome to a special edition of the Dr. Mead Show. I'm Sam Lasant. I'm going to be your moderator today. Folks, today we're going to do part two of knowing Dr. Mead who the person is. He's most respected, prominent, and talented knee surgeons, considered one of the top knee surgeons in the country. How did he get that way? But what about the person himself? Once again, doctor, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks, Sam. Thanks for having me. Yes. Uh, your, your, your reputation, okay, as being the top knee, uh, top knee surgeon in the country. Uh, show number one, we talked about your, your past and, and how you got where you were, um, where you are now. Uh, and you talked about the fellowship program and where you went, okay. So the question, uh, continue on. And for those of you who are just tuned in, you can always watch the first show uh, on our website, which is uh, ssptv.com. Every one of the Dr. Mead shows are there, uh, so you may want to get caught up and watch that show uh, as well as this show. So let me, let me continue on. Where did you go after your fellowship? So just, just to review, after you know, high school, I went to Penn State, and then I went to medical school at Jefferson, then I did... Uh, a, a year internship at, in Allentown at the Lehigh Valley Trauma Center, one year of trauma surgery up in Allentown. Then I went back to Jefferson and completed my five years of orthopedic residency program, and then I decided to do an extra year of sports medicine. And uh, you know, my mentor was Dick Rothman, who was a total joint doctor who told, taught me how to do total knees. He invited me back after my sports fellowship to help take care of the Philadelphia Eagles because they had that uh, medical contract. And Art Bartolozzi, who was a friend of mine two years older than me, just returned, and he was going to be the primary doc. And, you know, again, like I turned down Bruce Jarrell, who was my mentor to go into vascular surgery. Now Dick Rothman is asking me back, and, you know, you're, you're almost crazy to refuse him. But, um, you know, it's like, it's, uh, this, this story is interesting in my life because it will continue in the future. But, you know, it's like a sports team that just hires two top quarterbacks, you know, but the one quarterback is a year older than you and you're going to have to sit behind him. And frankly, I, I loved art, but I didn't want to be the number two doctor taking care of the Eagles. And I wasn't that fond of Philly. I'm from Pittston. I did a year in Allentown. And so I, I had to turn Dick Rothman down and say, no, I don't want to do this. But I remained good friends with Art Bartolozzi. Subsequently, uh, I'll fast forward after my fellowship and I was ultimately, you know, ended up in Allentown. Well, lo and behold, the Eagles signed a contract up at Lehigh University to do their summer camp. So Art and I eventually regrouped and we did somehow take care of the Eagles because when Art was in Philly and I was in Allentown and he needed a consultant to go to Lehigh and take care of any problems with the Eagles at summer camp, I was there. So ironically, I ultimately did regroup with them, but in a different manner. But to answer your question about my fellowship, so um, I ended up going out to Cincinnati, had a great year. Frank Noyes was a god of sports medicine. He's one of the most respected docs in sports medicine. I did a year of research. And so um, Frank Noyes asks me to stay on in Cincinnati and write a book with him. And now again, I have a mentor asking me to stay on and write a book and become an editor. And you know, by this time, um, you know, I started a family. I have Daniel, my first, my first born, and um, I was looking to go back home into Pennsylvania. And so, you know, I weighed staying there and writing a book, but I wouldn't do that much surgery. And like I said, I love operating on people. So I had to turn Frank Noise down and say, Frank, I'm, I'm going to go back to Pennsylvania. And so what are my choices? So I really have two choices. I call my friend Joe Caesar that operated on my shoulder in college, which is really one of the reasons I'm in orthopedics. And he says, Tom, he says, we'd love to have you come back to your hometown. Why don't you come back and interview with us? And so I really did. I had, I had uh, two interviews, one there and one in Allentown with the group I worked with after I did my internship with, with, in Allentown with Pete Kevlish and Cliff Vernon. So I go up to Scranton and Joe Caesar, I interview with him. At the interview, he goes, Tom, and this is great news. He says, we're interviewing another local guy your same age, Wayne Sebastianelli. And so I knew of Wayne, you know, in the orthopedic fraternity, you know everybody. He was, he was exactly my year. He was completing a fellowship up in upstate New York, I think. And he says, we're interviewing Wayne. As, Wayne is from Scranton, I'm from Pittston. And he says, we were the first fellowship trained docs to come back. He had Chris Metzger there who was taking care of the Phillies AAA franchise. And he said, we want a young sports guy. And so it was great. But then I said, I'm in the same position with Art Bartolozzi. I said, well, 
Joe, what does Wayne want to do? He's go, well, Wayne's not sure, and so now I'm not sure, so nobody was making a decision. And, I, and so ultimately, I did not want to go back and compete with Wayne Sebastianelli as two new sports guys. And so what happens, Wayne goes to Hershey and ultimately has a great career as the Penn State team doc for 20 years. I go to Allentown and I do level one trauma and start a sports program and then Joe Caesar, our friend and mentor, at least that year ended up with no sports doc. So that's ultimately how I decided to go back to Allentown, Pennsylvania, participate in level one trauma, do a lot of surgery. You become a very good surgeon as a trauma surgeon because you, you have no time to plan. The, the, the helicopter comes in, you've got people with motorcycle, open fractures, multiple injuries, you have to be very good at efficiency. And, and so that's what I did you know, at nights and on weekends. And then I developed the first sports medicine program in the Lehigh Valley. At that particular point in time, and there's uh, another, there's more of a, a fantastic story about Dr. Mead. Were you, were you happy with your accomplishments? Were you satisfied with your accomplishments? So, um, you know, to date I was, but I really wasn't out in practice yet. Every, you're, you're always under the watchful eye of your mentors. I mean, now it's jumping out of the plane with, you know, with no tether. So now it's time to start in your practice. And my first couple years, you know, I just wanted to establish myself, make sure I was confident with my skills, my results were good. And uh, then I became a little restless professionally. I wanted to grow the group I was with. We, we, we had five guys and, uh, and uh, no sports teams. So one by one, I went out and, and I became the team doc at almost every high school and college in the Allentown area, Emmaus, uh, Parkland, Whitehall, Allen, Deeruff, Muhlenberg, Cedar Crest, the sales, and one by one, I developed Allentown Sports Medicine. Now we grew out, grew out of the building, so we had to move in, into another building. So on one end, I was being a surgeon and sort of doing what I wanted to do, but I also had to be the developer of the infrastructure of what I was doing. And physically, we needed more buildings. So ultimately, I convinced my group, um, not very easily, to make to make several moves. And ultimately, I moved over to Lehigh Valley Hospital. We developed the sports medicine, the first medical fitness facility in the Lehigh Valley. I brought John Graham in from Hammett. He did an unbelievable job. And then we wanted to go out. I, we opened up satellite office in Lehighton, hometown, Hazleton, and ultimately built the largest sports medicine facility uh, in the country, a 300,000 three, square foot facility. Um, over on the west end of Allentown, right off the turnpike. So to answer my question, I was satisfied, but always continued to, to look at a bigger picture. Folks, uh, I'm talking to Dr. Tom Mead from the Dr. Mead Show, and I'm moderating this special edition of the Dr. Mead Show. We come back, we'll learn a lot more about the person, Dr. Mead. Welcome back to the Dr. Mead Show, folks. I'm Sam Lasanda. I'm moderating a special show on the person himself, Dr. Mead, uh, well-known, respected throughout the country. Uh, and, the Doctor, you know, you have, you're known locally as, you know, the best in knee surgery. But how did you become known nationally? So, well, it's an interesting story. Again, it's very non-traditional. I'm not at uh, a Mayo Cleveland Clinic. I, you know, I, I, I'm not with Dick Rothman at Jefferson. I'm not at Harvard. I'm in Allentown. But um, pe people knew me from um, what I was doing both clinically, um, <clears throat> building a practice like we just said, and ultimately after, you know, I built the largest sports practice and private practice and became a showcase theater for our imaging center, um, uh, I took the next step and, and joined Coordinated Health, which I thought was a great move because I also wanted to now be part of a hospital network and Emil Diorio was a great friend of mine my whole career. And so that was a wonderful ultimate clinical step uh, to move with them and be able to now uh, brainstorm with him and become part of a hospital network. But on the other end, I never gave up my academic career. I always wrote a little bit, I always spoke a little bit, traveled. I, ha I had friends like Steve Howell, another, another mentor that always 
uh, was a big researcher, a professor of uh, orthopedic surgery and mechanical engineer in California. Whenever he would develop something new, like an anterior cruciate ligament screw, he would call me and ask me to try it out because he knew, you know, I, I did a lot of volume and technically I, I was pretty good. And so I spoke with Steve on the circuit. We spoke in Chicago for a couple years. We taught other surgeons how to do anterior cruciate ligament reconstruction. So I, I was sort of on the, you know, the national circuit um, talking a little bit. Well then, a, a, big, a big opportunity is Steve called me and he was one of the earlier developers of, of something called 3D shape match guides. Basically it's a, a, a way to custom fit total knees instead of putting every knee in the same way. And uh, Steve asked me to do 12 of them. And, uh, and he said, give me your feedback. And so I got permission from my patients. I did 12 of them. I did 25 of them. They were the best total knee results I've ever had. And I never went back. And since that point, I did more custom fit total knees than anyone in the country, including Steve Howell, who brought me in because he spent a lot of time researching and writing. And I'm in the operating room. So all of a sudden, I caught the attention of the big implant companies and I was doing some consulting work and, and teaching, um, you know, I had some uh, contracts to teach surgeons if they came in my operating room from Depew and J&J &J and Biomet. And then Stryker really uh, was interested in this, in this uh, custom made total me. And so I did some work with Stryker and then they would ask me to speak around the country um, and ultimately, we had a great run. We had, we had a great results. And then a startup company would find me. And they'd say, you know, Dr. Mead, we have this new knee. What do you think of it? And I start working on it and designing it. And then the biggest sports medicine company in the world called Arthrex decided that just like my patients, I'm in sports medicine, and my sports medicine patients get old. And you know, after doing sports, their knees wear out and they need knee replacements. So I, which started out as a sports medicine guy, <clears throat> now do knee replacements because a lot of my patients when they were younger now need knee replacements. Well, the, the biggest sports medicine company in the world, Arthrex, the owner, Reinhold Schmeiding, calls me and says, Tom, I'm buying a startup knee company and it happened to be the one I was helping design the instruments. And he said, I want you to be our lead surgeon consultant. And here I am, all of a sudden, not at Mayo, not at Harvard. I'm in Allentown, one of the biggest implant companies in the country, hires me to help them develop their total knee system, their partial knee system, their kneecap replacement system. And that's what I've been doing for the last two years. And I've been speaking internationally, nationally. You know, I go down there and I have it designed pretty well. You know, once a month, once every two months, I work with their, it's like I have my own engineering team and lab. They are the fastest, most agile company in the country. And literally within two years, we've redesigned all the instruments. Um, and I am really, really excited about this knee that, that we've worked on. But anyway, that's a long story into how, you know, I sort of got on the radar of the major implant companies. And now, you know, I'm one of the designers of one of the new knees out there. It's pretty cool. I know there's many people who watch your show and you know, you're, you're the top knee doctor, okay? You need a knee done, you know, they know you. But are you limited just to doing knees? 99.9%, .9 I just do knees. I have this little hobby in my life that when I was doing trauma and I took care of the velodrome, the cyclists, they would fall and break their collarbones and, <clears throat> and uh, most orthopedic surgeons in the country never fixed them. So they'd be in a sling and they'd have a terrible fracture and it never made sense to me. And so we fix every other bone in the body except the clavicle. So I start fixing clavicles and they did great. Within a week, they're back on the track on the velodrome, but in orthopedics, it takes forever to change dogma. And so to make a long story short, there were no good clavicle plates. So I worked on developing a clavicle plate, which actually I still have uh, in final production right now. So, you know, one-tenth of one percent of my practice is, I don't advertise it, but I do clavicle fractures because I don't think many people do them well and the plates aren't that good. And so our team that does knees very well does clavicle fractures. So I have a practice that does knee surgery and clavicle fractures. Pretty bizarre, but that's how I do it. <laughs> <laughs> and you do it extremely well. You, you, you've grown uh, in northern, uh, northeastern and central Pennsylvania, uh, and you have goals. And I know, you know you're continuing growing all the time. What are your plans, uh, your future plans, 
for northeastern Pennsylvania. You know, Sam, medicine, medicine has changed. You know, I went to Allentown. I lived a quarter mile from Lehigh Valley Hospital. I worked in one hospital, and that was my life. Now, 25 years later, I'm with Coordinated Health. We have 16 <coughs> offices, and you know what? It's it, we're very efficient, but it's rewarding to bring your skill set to different communities. And and my heart is in the coal regions of Pennsylvania. I grew up there. You know, I moved, to, I opened an office in Hazleton because my dad had a career as a state policeman in Hazleton. But as I look back at Joe Caesar and Pittston, you know, my, my roots are in Pittston. Before my career is ending, and like I said, I've got two decades left, I always wanted to get back to where I grew up and be able to give something back and offer the skill set that I was fortunate enough to learn and be passed on. And so, uh, I've convinced AMOL and Coordinated Health to, uh, to uh, have a patient portal in the Wyoming Valley. So within the next, um, hopefully, three or four months, we are going to have a Coordinated Health office in northeastern Pennsylvania, in Pittston. I'm back to my roots. And uh, I'm going to, uh, right now, I treat maybe a third of my patients are from the Wyoming Valley, but they have to travel to Hazleton, Lehigh, and or Allentown. So I couldn't be more excited about bringing the Coordinated Health Hospital Network and my colleagues and their other skill sets. I do knees and clavicle fractures, but we're going to have a ball, and I'm excited about it. Folks, I'm talking to Dr. Tom Mead from the Dr. Mead Show. This is the Dr. Mead Show, and I'm moderating this special edition. Uh, the question when we come back is, how many surgeries do, does Dr. Mead really do a year? And the volume, the, you know, when you're doing a lot of surgeries, are they done right? Stay with us. Welcome back to the Dr. Meat Show, folks. Uh, it's a special edition, and I'm your moderator for today's show, Sam LaSand. We're talking to the person himself, Dr. Mead, uh, most respected um, uh, Dr. Uh, Mead is in the country as a knee surgeon uh, uh, and has probably one of the highest volumes uh, in the country. And that leads me to two questions. How many knee surgeries do you do a year, and who else in the country does as many as you or more? <laughs> You know, it, it's, it's interesting. It's going to uh, sound uh, different, but I probably do well over 1,000, maybe 12 to 1,300 knee surgeries a year. I'll put that in perspective. The average orthopedic surgeon in this country does about 300 procedures. It's not that he can't do more, but our industry is unbelievably efficient. I'm in the OR. Um, I had a visitor this week, and their goal was three by three, three knee surgeries by three o'clock. I mean, that's because, not that he's slow, but they, they start late, they have a slow turnover, they use one room, um, and it's just the most inefficient system. I think we're not, uh, there's a big physician shortage in this country, but I also think there's a big inefficiency in this country. Um, we have figured out how to do things very, very efficiently. So at, at Coordinated Health, I'm able to start at 6 in the morning, not at 8 o'clock, which, which I can't control at other hospitals. And I have a very, very efficient team. And some people say, well, if you're doing a high volume of surgery, uh, you know, is that good? Well, if you look at every other industry and you look at Six Sigma data or Toyota, the, the, the lowest number of errors you know, per million units produced is by the highest volumes because you are very efficient. Nobody repeats a step. Everybody knows it. And I have the privilege of just limiting my practice to knees. Very, very few people do that. So they do a little bit of ankles, a little bit of hips, knees, shoulders. That's what they, they do. And really, I, I don't know in the country, but I, there's very, very few people that do that. And it's a small fraternity. In Pennsylvania, the only you know, person I know that limited their practice to knees was Bob Booth, who was Dick Rothman's partner for years and one of my mentors, another phenomenal surgeon that I learned so much about efficiency from. He would run four rooms, but he had fellows and residents and that sort of thing. And Bob's getting uh, maybe in the uh, ninth inning of his career now, so I don't think he's quite doing the volume he used to. But other than that, I don't know anybody in, in Pennsylvania that has our team, our efficiency, a hospital network. Um, that Emil Diorio produced, and it gives us the ability to run two or three rooms, and we have no downtime. 
the complication rate goes down significantly by the time in the OR, time under anesthesia, time under tourniquet. So all those things have been proven to have the, the highest success rate and the lowest error rate. A big article this, this uh, week in our journal that showed the highest revision rate are in those hospitals that have the lowest volume. And the cutoff was somewhere if they do 150 or 200 knee surgeries you know, in the hospital per year, they have a highest success rate. You know, we'll do, you know, we'll do that volume in a month or two, not the whole hospital. Our hospital will do uh, six or 8,000 joint replacements. So that's a long answer to your question. How do you stay physically fit? Because that, that's a demanding, it, it's, uh, physically yeah. is very demanding. No, oh, it is. Our, our team, you should see our team. Our team is very, very fit. It's RJ. Uh, Tom Witter and Mike Mike Joyce they are they all work out tremendously RJ is a bodybuilder Tom Witter you know is in the gym every day Mike Joyce is running a race every weekend it takes stamina I mean when we get up in the morning we hit that OR it's like an athletic event mm -hmm. we you know we are there we are focused um, the team with us wants to be there um, you know we don't we don't s stop for lunch we eat all day. We eat a little bit all day long. We don't have that postprandial laziness. We don't go to the cafeteria and sit down. Good or bad, that's how we work. And it's, it's very efficient. Um, you know, uh, I'm on a master swim team. I, you know, I still do some team triathlons. And, you look uh, good, too. You look great. Well, you know, yeah, even at the end of the day, if I'm tired, I just love getting in the water, getting horizontal, work out pretty hard on the weekends. But uh, you, couldn't, you really can't do this volume if you're, if you're out of shape. Before we end the show, you've been a strong advocate and you've done shows, your Dr. Mead show, uh, on fish oil, okay? Yeah. Why are you such a strong uh, advocate of fish oil? It, it's, it's orthopedically based. Five, five, six years ago, the crisis in anti-inflammatories, Vioxx and Bextra was killing people. You know, the, the pharmaceutical companies weren't admitting it. They knew this. And actually, I go back to my mentor, Dick Rothman. It's always good never to burn bridges. Even though I didn't go back there, we remained good friends. He and Pete Sharkey realized the same thing. And so we realized that fish oil is a natural anti-inflammatory. Think of it like an, like an Aleve or, a, uh, uh, or an Advil but without the side effects, and it's natural. And it has the side effects of lowering you know, cardiac arrhythmias, heart disease, um, death after surgery, memory loss as you get older. It was a no-brainer as we did research. And so uh, a little knowledge is dangerous, so there's good, good fish oil and bad fish oil. So we let's, actually- Let's talk about that yeah. because uh, I always get the question sometimes on my show, the Sam yeah. Lassane show, when I had you and Sharky or Dr. Gross on, yeah. and, and what's the difference and what fish oil should they be taking? Because you know, they're gonna buy this fish oil for nine, yeah. $9 or whatever. Yeah. It's, you know, it's like, I always say it's like high test gas. You know, if you go to the gas station and uh, you go, wow, there's high test gas for 50 cents a gallon. I would, you know, I wouldn't put it in my car, you know, because they all come from the same refineries and yeah. fish oil is the same thing. If you're buying a big bottle for five bucks, you're in trouble. And it's not as regulated as the pharmaceutical industry. So you've got to buyer beware. You've got to make sure that the fish oil company could be a pharmaceutical company tomorrow. They use good manufacturing practices. Um, you know, I, the natural form in fish is triglyceride form, so the triglyceride form is what we recommend. It's the natural form. It's produced by pharmaceutical quality, and there's actually clinical research studies going on with your product. So um, you know, we actually named the brand PRN because PRN means as needed, but it's physician-recommended nutraceuticals. If we're physicians, Dick Roth, myself, Pete Charkey, Mike Gross, recommending this stuff, it better be the good stuff that doesn't cause diarrhea, smells like fish, repeats on you. And so that's sort of you know, how we got into the omega-3 world. Uh, folks, I'm talking to Dr. Mead. Uh, this is a special edition of the Dr. Mead Show. Remember, folks, you can watch all of the Dr. Mead shows on our website, ssptv.com, uh, all of the shows, and also his other show, very interesting. If you're thinking of considering knee surgery, then you want to watch his other show, Real Life in the OR, and that's also on our, uh, our website. Doctor, thanks for being my guest. Uh, thanks for having me moderate your show today. <laughs> Sam, thanks for having me. This is a reflection. I am just getting started. So I I'm know looking you are. forward to my career. Folks, we'll see you next time.